And thanks for staying with us. First up, Majority Leader Oseche Mensa Bonsu has revealed that the current negotiation with the International Monetary Fund will delay the presentation of the 2023 budget. The Public Financial Management Act mandates that the budget is presented by the 15th of this month. But speaking to journalists, uh, Ms. Oseche Mensa Bonsu said, a team from the IMF is expected in the country next week for further talks, and it's unlikely the budget will come uh, off by the stipulated time. I'm not too sure as a city. I still have to have some discussions with um, the minister responsible for finance to determine exactly when you'll be able to submit the document to us. As you do know, the Public Financial Management Act provides that um, the budget should be presented to the House latest the 15th of this month. Um, the discussions that are going on now involving the, the, um, the IMF, I think is going to take a little bit of a while. My understanding is that um, it will go into um, the first few days of next week, uh, around the 10th or so. If, if that is the case, uh, you know, you then have to strand out the conclusions and factor them into the budget. And um, after we've succeeded in doing that, because it's a budget for government, you have to go before cabinet for some discussions, integrations, and maybe um, additions and subtractions before it comes ultimately to parliament. So I believe it's going to be. Uh, quite difficult to, to submit to the 15th deadline. I don't know. I'm just conjecturing. Um, but if you want to do a tidy work, maybe you require to have some space to be able to do um, a tidy work. Because as we all do know, these are uh, not normal times. And you want to do uh, a tidy job in order to reposition the country. Nothing should be done which eventually become uh, wishy-washy. We want to have the best to be able to um, uplift us from where we are as a country. And that being the case, if we want to do a thorough job, I think there will be too much pressure if it has to be done on the 15th. Well, the majority leader also said investigations into allegations that a wealthy businessman tried to bribe MPP MPs to back down on their calls for the dismissal of Finance Minister Ken of Rieta will focus on unraveling the motives of the said businessman. According to him, despite about 80 of uh, his colleagues calling for the dismissal, the position is now that of the entire majority caucus. That's an attempted bribery case. Uh, whether bribery or inducement or whatever. As I stated, yes, it's come to my notice and uh, that issue has come before us. Let me, let me say that uh, it is not the group that started that, um, that maybe somebody attempted to bribe. I'm saying so because even though the issue started with uh, about 80 plus, the, the group of 80 plus, the caucus meeting aligned with the position of that group. So it's no longer the cause of the 80 plus group. It's the, the, the agenda for the entire caucus. And we're having some discussions on that. Uh, but um, with particular reference to the attempted bribery. Yes, I've been informed about that, and as I responded to the same matter um, when I was interviewed by one of your prime stations, I said that it's come before me. Um, we'll investigate if it is true, and if it's true, to establish the motive of uh, that person.
All right, let's turn to some other stories for you. The National Petroleum Authority has defended the recent hikes in prices of petroleum products at the pumps. According to the authority, the unstable foreign exchange market is making it difficult for importers to get products. Head of Communications at the MPA, Mohamed Kudus, tells Joy Business there was an unexpected situation which caused the increment before the normal pricing window. I'm allowed to borrow the expression of the president when he said that we are in crisis. It means that we are not in normal times. Similar with our industry, we are not in normal times. Critical things that determine the price of the product, okay, is the forex, the cost of the dollar, and the cost of the product on the international market. Um, uh, unexpectedly, and something we've not seen for a long while, the CD kept changing within the week. Okay, the reason that we are able to do the two weeks window is because of the stability that we have in the market. So you, it allows you a certain predictability. So you know that the CD will remain stable, even if it was going to erode or gain, it will be a little marginal. But in this particular case, you realize that we're having a CD that we started around six uh, at the beginning of the year, was close to almost 15 somewhere last week. And to where you have with a spate of um, let's say a week the CD is losing its value against the dollar what it means is that it is going to be eroding the gains and capital of the marketers okay and given that it determines the price and uh, uh, how the final price is arrived at and that is basically what we do at MPA we try to see what is it that has informed your price and so Knowing what was happening in the market, we felt that it was nothing untoward. So it is not as though the window has been suspended. No, the window still remains. The principle still remains. But we were being sensitive to the practicality of the day, the real issue that has confronted the marketer, so that you allow the marketer to be able to still be in business, so the, the marketer can still bring the product into the market, the consumers can still get the product. Also in the news this afternoon, poultry farmers are predicting the cost of a full chicken to hit between 150 and 200 cities during the festive season. According to them, prices of feed for the poultry has, uh, have doubled in the last few months as a result of the depreciation of the city and high cost of imports of other farm input. Greater Kwa President of the Ghana Poultry uh, Farmers Association, Isaac Awuza, uh, joins us on Zoom to discuss this. Uh, grateful you could join us here. What is causing this astronomical increase? A lot of the raw material that we use, majority of them are imported. The main one is the soya bean meal. Soya bean meal, that beginning of the year, we're buying it at 200 Ghana CD. Now, as I'm talking to you, it's over 600 Ghana CD per 50 kg bag. And you buy it today, tomorrow, by the time you go back, the price has changed. So a lot of the raw material that we are using, because they are imported, uh, and as a result of the unstable uh, forest, also affected. So that is one of the major reasons. Another uh, major thing that is affecting us is the unavailability of maize. Uh, fortunately for us, this year we couldn't get, I mean, much harvest. And as a result of that, the maize even is not available for you to buy in order to produce uh, the feed. And the feed prices, I uh, can tell you, has quadrupled. And majority of our farmers have decided to fold up or even to reduce the number of beds that the, they are having. And this is what is really affecting the poultry industry. I know you guys are struggling a lot, plus you have to compete with imports, right? That is true. You know, uh, currently, the local industry is taking just about 2%, and even this 2% is, 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 is even being threatened. And about 98% of, 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 of uh, imported chicken is being brought into the country, and this is really affecting the local poultry industry and uh, uh, the earlier the government come to the aid of the poultry industry, especially Greater Accra Poultry Farmers Association, the better for the uh, for the poultry industry because of the importation of this uh, frozen chicken into the country. 
uh, it seems there's no help, there's no assistance for the local pottery industry. And this is also really affecting us, I mean, uh, very much in the, in, the, in the pottery industry. Okay, um, and so uh, how are poultry farmers coping uh, with the high cost of doing business? I say this because the last time I spoke with uh, the Poultry Farmers Association, we got the indication that most of you, uh, you guys are folding up. That is true. They are finding it very difficult. And uh, uh, people who are buying, let's say, uh, 300 bucks of feed within uh, two weeks or a week, just reduced drastically. They are no more buying. They can't. They buy just few bucks, and uh, a lot of them too are selling their best. And uh, those who, I mean, would have loved to uh, go into broilers have stopped because of the high cost of feed. And it, uh, I can assure you that come December, a broiler might cost even one fifty or even two hundred. If 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 if. Uh, I'm not. I'm not uh, um, afraid to say so. So a lot of these things are affecting the number of beds that pottery uh, farmers uh, are, are doing. And the earlier the government comes to the aid of the pottery industry, the better uh, for the country. Well, speak of government aid. I want to ask you about the rearing for food and jobs program that was recently uh, introduced by the government. Is that helpful in any way? It has not helped, my brother. It has not helped in any way because as I'm talking to you, we don't have maize. You go to the north, our neighboring countries are coming for those maize and they are bringing higher prices for those maize. So the, that, that, that policy, to be honest with you, has not helped the poultry industry. And I believe uh, policymakers have to sit down and have a second look at it so that in a way it will help the local industry to sustain this uh, poultry industry for all of us. All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us, President of the Greater Kwa Poultry Farmers Association. Um, Isaac, I was at there. Uh, as poultry farmers predict that the cost of a full chicken uh, could reach 150, between 150 and 200 cities during the festive season, that's uh, something we do not want happening. But as indicates, uh, it's because of the high cost of farm inputs as well as feed. We'll continue to follow that for you. You're watching the marketplace. Moving on, among the 35 companies listed on the Ghana Stock Exchange, women hold 5% of the board seats and 27% of non-executive director seats. Yet, this number has remained the same since 2021. According to the 2022 Board Diversity Index report released by the Boardroom Africa in partnership with the Ghana Stock Exchange, uh, progress towards gender diversity has stalled since last year. And joining us on Zoom to discuss this is Ayomide Mimi Aborua, uh, Programs and Partnerships Manager, the Boardroom Africa. Thanks for your time. Tell us a bit more about the findings and how you came about it. Um, thank you so much for having me. So um, at the Boardroom Africa, what we do is we map African listed boards to, gender, um, to determine the gender diversity makeup. So with our um, Ghana Board Diversity Index, what we did find was that, like you mentioned, amongst the companies, that 25% of women are still, on the, are still occupying board seats, as well as 27 non-executive director seats. And this hasn't changed. And then also when we look at the data, we see that the common role held by women across Ghana listed companies are that of a corporate secretary, mm. a position, in fact, not a board director role. So with this, what we see is that, you know, it is critical that women not only have a seat at the table, but occupy positions of leadership just to ensure that continuous progress is made in the boardroom. And this actually has to be led by boards. What we see from the data is that Figures are low and also they are not increasing. Whilst we do recognize that there is a general increase in the acknowledgement of you know, responding to the call for gender diverse boards, the overall gender gap remains wide. 38% of companies still have zero to one woman on their boards. And, and what reasons uh, did you identify? identify for this stored progress in board diversity? Yes. So like we mentioned, you know, 25% of women occupy board seats and 27 non-executive director seats. And this also 
it's still the same as last year. So what we did observe was that even in general, the director um, positions, there was not much of a change. So it could be inferred that, you know, there were not that many board appointments that were made between last year and this year. And then when you also look at the makeup of the existing boards, it's potential that um, the boards were also not refreshed, i.e. The, the current boards, you know, they're not refreshed and they're not um, looked at to ensure that it reflects, you know, modern, re modern realities in terms of its gender diversity makeup. It's important to ensure that boards are continually refreshed, especially when gender diversity is concerned. And, and then like... Yeah, oh, go on. Sorry. Oh, yes. I was going to say, as I mentioned, you know, when we look at the um, females that are in the corporate secretary um, roles, also corporate secretaries can form as a pipeline to potential director roles. So it also could be inferred that, you know, this pipeline is not being effectively used in terms of progress for board diversity. I mean, you talk about the fact that boards must, must be refreshed. What can be done to bridge the gender gap on boards? Yes, I think the most important point is understanding that there's actually a problem and recognizing that something has to be done. And this recognition should influence a decision to act. So that decision can then cut to, you know, companies instituting policies that ensure that, you know, there is a mandate for, you know, X percent or 30 percent, which is actually the international standard, you know, 30 percent of women on our boards. Additionally, at the Boardroom Africa, we have our board diversity charter which is an initiative that calls on organizations to sign on to signal their commitment towards board diversity. You know, board diversity is typically seen as a checklist exercise, i.e. we have women on our boards and that's the end. But we want to ensure that progress, and sh and progress is continued. So by signing on that charter, it's companies committing towards doing something to ensure that they're working at their gender diversity makeup. So, so what can females do in terms of building capacity to increase their presence on boards? Um, yeah, because usually the excuse is, well, they are not up to it. Yes, um, I think it's important that, you know, training is provided. First of all, you know, when you think of board director roles, there are not as much formal trainings that are available for women. So I believe that, you know, women should look towards training programs, executive development programs that prepare them for board opportunities. At the Boardroom Africa, we have our Open Doors program where we, you know, equip um, female directors as well as aspiring directors with the necessary skills to lead in the boardroom. Beyond leading in the boardroom and beyond, you know, and um, taking these training, it's important that women also network with key stakeholders, and then also they're investing in training that might be specific towards their company's needs or the um, areas of skills that they want to develop. So training will help them to best position and take, you know, these opportunities. Would you support uh, a regulation that compels companies to have a percentage of females uh, in the boardroom, some sort of affirmative action? Most definitely, you know, regulation can be a, cha um, a catalyst for change. And like we mentioned, you know, compelling these companies is what will influence their decision to act i.e., you know, gender diversity is not something that's just only being spoken about, but then due to such regulation, they're also ensuring that they are measuring and monitoring their progress with regards to their gender diversity makeup. Mm. And so as we have this conversation, I just wanted to tell our audience, why is diversity in the boardroom important? Why should companies deliberately ensure that? Yes, so there's actually been a growing body of research that states that you know, gender diversity in the boardroom has tangible benefits from increased innovation, also to increased employee engagement, amongst other factors. It's important that a diverse board reflects you know, today's realities and also a best position a board to engage with its various stakeholders. You know, companies should deliberately ensure that its representation is achieved at the board level and it's also championed there too, because leadership starts from the top. The tone is set from the top. It's the board of directors have a fundamental role in setting the example, and that is crucial to make a difference when we talk about gender diversity. All right, and, and so this survey was done in partnership with the Ghana Stock Exchange. I just want to find out what next from here after releasing this uh, report. 
Yes, so we also work with, you know, it's it's a country-specific report. So we've launched our Ghana um, Biodiversity Index, and it's to also keep publishing such analysis and data across, you know, listed companies on the continent. So we've done for Ghana, and we'll work on, you know, publishing such report for other, you know, other countries, as well as advocating for companies to sign a Biodiversity Charter. So we're not just talking about gender diversity, but we are doing something about it. Happy to speak with you this afternoon, uh, Ayomide Aborowa, and uh, hope to speak to you in the near future. Appreciate your time. Programs Manager at the Boardroom Africa, thank you for your time. Thank you. That ends the marketplace. Before we go, we just want to update you on a big program coming up. That's our pre-budget forum uh, that's going to be hosted by uh, Benjamin Akako and Winston Amwa. It's on the topic, Ghana's alien economy, 2023 budget to the rescue. Uh, we have on the bill uh, Professor Peter Quote, who is director of ESA, Dr. Priscilla Chumesi Bafo, who is senior lecturer, Economics Department, University of Ghana, Dr. Humphrey Yim Dake, president of AGI, Kukwa Adam, CEO of Clay Group, and Dr. Joseph Obain, president of Guta. That conversation on the 7th of November 2022 from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. You don't want to miss it. And that's our program uh, this afternoon. Thanks for watching. We will be back same time tomorrow.